Hello, I'm Alexander Rose. I'm an executive director here at Long Now. I'm coming to you live from our headquarters and the bar and cafe of The Interval, where a week ago we filmed tonight's talk with Lonnie J. Abby Brooks. Uh, when we film here during the pandemic, we make sure to keep our staff and speakers as safe as possible by wearing masks and keeping distancing. Um, and but mainly tonight, I'm really excited to have Lonnie here. Uh, he is a past collaborator with Long Now on our educational initiatives, and a talk on Afro futures is truly long overdue for us. Uh, Lonnie's been immersed in the world of futures thinking for decades, and more recently in Afro futures. And tonight, he's going to talk to us about that journey and. Uh, really about broadening the space for futures thinking in general, because the more perspectives uh, that we have on this, um, it truly makes us all richer and have more interesting futures. So welcome, Lonnie J. Avi Brooks. Thank you. Thanks, Xander. It's great to be back here. And this is a nice homecoming. Uh, I've worked with the Long Now Foundation with our long-term and futures thinking project at Cal State East Bay. And and working with the Institute for the Future as a research affiliate has been wonderful in terms of really bringing to light Afrofuturism. And so I'm happy to be back here. But first, let me talk a little bit about my own journey, how I got here. You know, I think it was the debut of Wired Magazine when it first came out that I was like, I fell in love with um, these images of the future. I became an intern for the Institute for the Future and actually wrote my dissertation on them. But then I also realized wow, the future is overwhelmingly white here. So when I became immersed in the professional areas of foresight with the Institute for the Future, you know, they have a tradition of really talking about the future and pioneering that tradition. As a nonprofit, they've also, you know, had to have a variety of clients that are more corporate focused, more consumer focused, you know, practical and it makes sense. It's, you know, they're trying to, you know, survive as futurists, right? It's not easy. And so in that sense, though, it leaves a gap, right? Because if you're just talking about how people are mapping, how corporations are mapping in our lives 10 to 50 to 100 years from now, or how consumers will spend their money in the future, you're, you're glossing over a lot of peoples in the world that respond to imagination differently. What it means to me is that you know, after years of growing up and largely not seeing black people represented in the future, you know, every straight white male gets the privilege of having seen their own superhero, someone reflecting them in movies of science fiction and fantasy. So we see George Jetson and his wife, and the closest thing that you get to resembling a black figure is maybe the sassy maid, you know, the robot, who's had enough at times. I contributed to this wonderful anthology called Afrofuturism 2.0. I have chapter eight. It's called Playing a Minority Forecaster in Search of Afrofuturism. Where am I in this future, Stuart Brand? It's a nice homage to Stuart in many ways and also a critique, but it's good because really it's about how do we find our futures to make sure that black futures matter here. So I share a dream to ensure that long oppressed racial minority and diverse voices can articulate themselves in the futures imagined, in the practices of long-term thinking, and in the professional areas of foresight, celebrating the black imagination. Black people have always been futurists. You see, we had to be. Afrofuturism claims to reclaim and transform the trauma of past atrocities against the black and Afroqueer diaspora. Afrofuturism combine science fiction and fantasy to re-examine how the future is currently imagined, to envision alternative futures based on the black experience. As slavery forced Africans to confront an alien world surrounded by colonial technologies, Afrofuturism is born out of cruelty and that cruelty of the white imagination and some complicity with the African imagination as well was a necessary condition out of which the African diaspora had to reimagine its future. You see, the Black experience is futuristic. It's more like a middle passage. It's a science fiction horror story. You know, think about this. West Africa as our, the home planet of the Black diaspora, where with the latest in bondage technologies, we were transported against our will in ships designed to carry rows and rows of people in chains. And once they got to this alien world in the Americas, 
They were killed if they spoke their language or tried to practice their religion or play their music. In this world, they had to innovate, adapt, capitulate, succumb, and rebuild their former lives and traditions. They were sold, auctioned off to the nearest bidder, families torn apart. They had to reinvent themselves and create new Black technologies to repair the trauma that they had just experienced and keep experiencing. They were innovators in an alien landscape. You see, they had to create what scholars call sonic utopias. They're future scenarios. Spirituals are future scenarios envisioning Zion. It's our vibranium, you know, the metal that helped build Wakanda, this fantastic metal that you could apply in different ways. But spirituals were also coded signals of future liberation. You know that tune, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot? It's cold for movement. Something's getting ready to happen. Looked over Jordan and what did I see? It's a coded metaphor for the Ohio River, for slaves that could escape into Canada. A band of angels coming after me. It's code for conductors gonna help me get my freedom. So the spiritual, the dance, the art, is our cultural vehicle, our spaceship, transporting the black imagination to our future selves and generations. This is our truth, our currency, our power, and thus we are vibranium. So really when we talk about imagining Afro futures, we're talking about imagining, tracing, and recovering Afro futures. And what does that mean? Yeah, Afro futures on 1.0 really emerged in the 1940s with Sun Ra, uh, post-World War II and uh, pre-emergence of the World Wide Web. And that emerged to describe the African-American imaginations and engagement with science fiction, music, art, technology. If you think about, there's a guy named Helmut and a voice spoke to him in the early 40s and said, hey, you know what? Black people came from another planet. You should stop doing what you're doing and work on your music. And this person became Sun Ra the early jazz musician who innovated in jazz and art and created his own band that's here with us today. And it really ushered in kind of this wave of Afrofuturism, experimentation with art and music. It was going on before, but this is where it really takes on kind of an otherworldly feeling. Let's take a listen to Sun Ra for a minute too, so you can kind of hear how he's experimenting with the future. We have the mothership connection with Parliament Funkadelic that continues in with George Clinton and that music. Continuing with that, we have Public Enemy and their album, Fear of a Black Planet. And then we have illustrious writers like Samuel Delaney and Octavia Butler. Samuel Delaney etches out this queer alien world in Dahlgren. And Octavia Butler talks about, in Parable of the Sower, about this miraculous woman who lives in the year 2020s, where society is collapsing around them. They have a president who ignores the marginalized. And so she's embodies this empathic power to be able to feel what people are feeling. And she leads her community up north to recreate a new type of world for them. And Octavia Butler wrote this in the late 90s. Now, we come to Afrofuturism 2.0. And this is another wave, the rise of astro-blackness and the black speculative arts movement. We're actually in Afrofuturism 2.0 right now. Afrofuturism blossoms into all these different types of genres. And there's even new ones emerging like African futurism and black quantum futurism too. There's a great quote from and term from the Reverend Andrew Rollins that talks about the rise of astro-blackness. It's about a person's black state of consciousness released from a confining and crippling colonial and slave mentality, who becomes aware of the multitudes and varied possibilities and probabilities within the universe. So astro-blackness shifts us from this modern era of blackness to a planetary perspective in response to the challenges facing black life in the early 21st century. Now, I call 2018 the year of the panther when 
the Black Panther film came out. And, you know, it's, was wondering, like, how did Futurism 2.0 end up on local ABC News, as I did? I was able to articulate what the Black Panther meant to me. The smash box office hit. And I can tell you, when I was at the community screening at the Grand Theater in Oakland, I was thrilled. First of all, to see Oakland on the screen being portrayed. And then next, flying into this beautiful etched city of Wakanda. It's the whole community in the theater were just like, yes! <laughs> you know, it was just one of those moments. You see, there was this exhibition going on in the Schoenberg Center for the Study of uh, Black Studies. It was called The Alchemy of the Black Imagination. And you had this wonderful exhibition of fantastic artwork that imagined Black people on different planets, in the galaxy, on Earth, with new types of technologies. It extends what Afrofuturism 2.0 does, is it extends the edges of radical Black art. It's transnational. It's transcontextual. It's diasporic. It's a cultural worldview for interrogating Eurocentric motifs, the linear constructions of past, present, and future. So it goes further. It, it extends Afrofuturism 1.0 even more. You know, Tiffany Barber and Ronaldo Anderson have this wonderful quote where they say, the Black angel of history has traveled across beyond space and time to prepare us for a future African Zion beyond this place of wrath and tears. See, it carries and extends where we've been before. So 2.0, the version of Afrofuturism, extends the reach of radical Black visual art, literature, theater, social and applied sciences, and critical theory in the US. And so the alchemy of the Black imagination ushered in this wonderful movement called the Black Speculative Arts Movement that was co-founded by Ronaldo Anderson and John Jennings and others. You see, the one thing I want to make clear here, too, is I'm one head talking, but with me and alongside me are thousands, hundreds, millions of people that are part of this wave of Afrofuturism. Some people are into African futurism, Black quantum futurism, and the Black speculative arts movement. It's a wave that we're experiencing, and we're just riding that wave right now. You see, it's all about tracing the black fantastic. Less than 2% of card-carrying professional futurists identify as black, but that doesn't mean there aren't plenty of black futurists and foresight strategists and futures visionaries abundant in the streets, the arts, at the protests, in tech labs. So tracing the black fantastic refers to what Richard Eitan talks about, the minor key sensibilities generated from the experiences of the underground. You see, we can see it around us right now, and the protests going on across the nation. Those minor keys are being played, tested, experimented, extended. So tracing the, the Black fantastic means to recover past, progressive, liberating alternative futures and sprouting them into the present. We also have these fantastic science fiction authors, women authors, who are breaking barriers, like N.K. Jemisin with Fifth Season, and Binti by Nnedi Okorafor, winning Hugo and Nebula Science Fiction Awards. We have graphic novels coming out like The Black Panther Party and Infinitum by Tim Fielder that really talk and meet the past with the present. You see, The Black Panther Party began in the 60s, and when I looked at their 10-point program, I agreed with every point they made. They were talking about reparations, free access to quality healthcare and education, where we realize that in the film of the Black Panther and are still struggling with that right now in 2020. Unbelievable, but we are. And we have this wave and renaissance of movies like Sorry to Bother You and The Black Klansman. And these wonderful murals that were up on 9th Street in Oakland by Tarika Lewis that proclaimed a Wakanda and Okanda here already too, interrogating you know, this lineage of Black history in Oakland. There's Erica Huggings, too, a former leader of the Black Panther Party, who envisions how to speak about white privilege. And so it's, we have these leaders, these, these elders, like Tarika Lewis and Erica Huggings and Angela Davis, who are our sages, 
who are these black visionary thinkers that are still alive. We are learning so much from them. So tracing the black fantastic as our cultural vibranium, it's about reading their radically hopeful possibilities into a future augmented with progressive values and fused with more black soul. You know, CLR James really has this great quote. He talks about that the fundamental task is to recognize the democratic socialist Afro-queer utopia society and record the facts of its existence so that we can see these scenes and moments are read as outposts of a new society. In walking around Oakland, especially right now in San Francisco and Oakland, you see these wonderful art pieces done by Black artists and some white artists too, talking about their inspirations about the future where Black lives matter. Now, in order to trace this and what's been happening in terms of Black futures thinking, I came up with a term called Afro-future types. So future types trace the circulating science fiction capital filled with promises of the future that can simultaneously constrain and unleash our imaginations. So Afro-future types are Black signals of the future that find and reclaim the traces of Black cultural visions alongside erasures of those very signals too. You see, it wasn't until recently that I even knew about Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That a signal, a beacon of Black liberation, Black imagination was literally bombed to the ground. Hundreds, if not thousands of people died in unmarked graves. And those remaining folks were herded into a concentration camp. The literal erasure of an ascendant people that just a few generations before had been enslaved. That's a black signal worth talking about, investigating, amplifying, revisiting, and amplifying it more. Brian Eno once said, you know, what computing needs is more soul. Well, we're in the age of artificial intelligence. How do we make sure that artificial intelligence has an African soul? You see, it really reflects where the Afrocentric view shifts this emphasis from opposing binaries to juxtaposing dimensions where a range of truths can be held to create. And these foundations to understand quantum computing have been among Black people for centuries to hold the one and the zero simultaneously. So what if, what would artificial intelligence look like if it was infused with Afroqueer and Afroqueer AI? The Afrofuture Center perspective is intersectional and rejects binaries. For a long while now, futures thinking and Afrofuturism haven't really addressed the plight of trans Black bodies, of queer people, and their tradition and our tradition. And it wasn't until recently that the National LGBTQ Task Force apologized to trans people for ignoring them. And we have, in the past, you know, in the past several years, uh, trans people who are being killed in an alarming way, and they're Black trans people. And so we want to make it clear that Black trans lives matter, that Black queer people matter. I'm a product of multiple identities growing up in Los Angeles, and even in Los Angeles as, as Black and Jewish and queer. And, uh, you know, I was, um, I had to uh, navigate numerous types of, of identities. And I just remember this point in 1983 where I was in class with my English teacher at Fairfax High School in Los Angeles. And he begins the class proclaiming, you were all homosexual. We looked at each other, kind of scared, initially shocked, wondering, how did he know that about us? His point, and you know, it's not a new one, but queerness and most everything else is on a spectrum. We are all queer and partake in queerness and queer time. And I think it's an important point to understand how time can get out of its linear construction, that we can talk, actually talk about what queer time might mean. See, the Black experience shapes our lives. Afro-queerness is part of our DNA. Part of that is really starting with the birth of our species, you know, 150,000 years or so ago, where we didn't have terms like queer or uh, homosexual or homophobia, and what life could have been like there, and to kind of imagine it. At the birth of our human species, uh, we had queerness weaved within it. If we look to indigenous tribes, uh, they have a, a, a space for gender fluidity, a third gender, gender fluid pathways that they celebrate. 
people who are gender fluid in Native American tribes and in Aboriginal tribes are shamans. They're healers. They're future visionaries. You know, this is really excellent statuette of the first people having sex that was ever discovered. They're just wrapped around each other and you can't tell what their gender is. And I think that really encapsulates Afro-queer and queer time. We can trace Afro-queerness in Egypt. There's also a tale of two manicurists for the Pharaoh. And when they rediscovered their tomb, it shows them with their noses together and mouths almost nearly together. And that's a sure sign that they were a couple. Because usually it's, it was of opposite sexes, but it shows them together and they were revered and it wasn't a problem. Or as the, colon, as the colonists arrived to the African continent and tried to make tribes shamed for their fluid gender pathways. And so, and we're still struggling with it, right? There's this, you know, a big, a big sort of uh, Eurocentric Christianity abounded in Africa that doesn't recognize LGBTQ rights. So I want to sort of come back to kind of pre-colonial times, this existence. And, uh, and there's, you know, really great activists in Africa working in the African nations working on this too, uh, to really bring queer futures and black lives to the forefront and can making that connection and keep making that connection. You know, a great collaborator of mine, Nigel Whitson at UC Riverside, She's working on this great essay called Super Fluid, Super Black. And they proclaim in this fantastic quote, I am a black, queer, trans, non-binary artist flowing fluently like the memory of my super fluid slipping ancestors and transestors. As my elder, E.F. Fuyakati, often reminds me, if we are, then someone else in our line was. We are not the first. And so that's really important because if you think about it, in what W.B. Du Bois talks about double consciousness, they have a heightened consciousness. They're able to see the fluid inter intersections of identities that they're living with on a daily basis to guide their tribe. And so I think, you know, 150,000 years ago, this must be queer time. This is queer time. They didn't have the terms for it, but I feel like it's time to really acknowledge within the black tradition that queerness has existed. There's this great documentary film artist, Leo Herrera, who completed this project called The Father's Project, If They Lived. And he creates a series of four documentary film, fictional film documentaries about what it would have happened if the leaders during the AIDS epidemic had lived. And he can't really imagine, creates a queer future world where the queer colonies have flourished. And he talks about the political influence of these queer colonies on the rest of the US and that the queer colonies are becoming their own autonomous regions, which I love as well, too. And so through a series of four films, he leads us through these fantastic images that end, you know, finally also evokes one of the uh, leaders of ACT UP who's running for president in 2020. And uh, so these, these types of things really inspire me to proclaim queer time continues with us. So I also aim to queer the categories of forecasting, future studies, and foresight as they are practiced. So it comes from a long tradition of African culture that really didn't see race and class in the same way that we do. It recognizes the interconnectedness of all things into, which is Bantu for interconnectedness. It gives you a wider aperture on the future where so many Corporations and organizations and government agencies have tried to see the future through a straw. Seeing it through black perspectives opens it up so you can see signals and black signals and Afrofuture types happening on the streets in front of you. So they're getting there. But you know, as a movement, the black speculative arts movement and Afrofuturism uh, really had to, had to speak to black futures that just wasn't being done. But the black speculative arts movement we call it BSAM for short. These BSAM festivals that have been going on across the country, they've been expanding in the US, embraced by Canada, in Europe, and in South Africa. The sheer poster art itself, principally done by Stacey Robinson and others, is worthy of an exhibition. I was lucky to have the chance to be part of a futures computer mixed reality lab called Dynamic Lab. And they were opening themselves up to the community to see how their mixed reality technology could help augment 
the future visions of their communities surrounding them. And I got this vision of what if we had a map of Wakanda? And as we went through the different regions of Wakanda, we saw people's alternative visions of the future. So we actually created a little demo of that. And it was really fun to, to see it come into existence. And we even put Bosco Conti there too, uh, singing Afrofuturism <laughs> in this little blurb. You know, Ahmed Best, he played Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars. He, he came to uh, the studio uh, with, a, with an idea of a black uh, Star Trek comedy. And they were like, what are, you, what are you saying? Black people aren't interested in the future. And that really struck me and him that, wow, you know, the white patriarchal st structure doesn't get it. That Afrofuturism is something that can feed not only black souls, but everyone's soul in creating more varieties of imagination. In talking, we kept coming to, back to the same point, that usually when we're in the room, we're the only people of color talking about the future. And he said, why don't we create a podcast together? So we did, and we call it the Afrofuturist Podcast, where Ahmed, for an hour with one-on-one, one -on -one, has these um, in-depth conversations with people that we don't usually see. So the Afrofuturist Podcast is in its third year right now. And so we are trying to uncover the stories of Black people and others that are doing work about the future. So that's part of what we do. So at Dynamic Land, I met a great white ally of mine and friend, Eli Kuzminski. And together, we created uh, a game called Afro Rhythms from the Future. We really realized we needed a game that spoke to the Black experience and to people of color and indigenous people. We decided to take an existing forecasting game called The Thing from the Future. A uh, great game by Stuart Candy and Jeff Watson. We've uh, play tested this game in a number of venues. And with the help of a research, creative research group called The Fathomers, it's a card deck of uh, about 100 cards. People have different roles that they play as traveler, seer, or elder. And um, they then uh, get dealt a set of cards to play their role. Now, this game, what we noticed, and from folks like Jake Dunnigan and Jay McGonagall, who've done work on this, Jay McGonagall was super better in using games to heal people. We've thought about this game as a way to help rework our memories, rework Black memories, by creating new scenes and new futures that renew positive associative neural pathways. You see, the regions of the brain that celebrate the past or that form the past also form our futures. They're in the same regions through MRI studies. So what if we used gaming to heal trauma as a call for a futures therapy of the mind to jam and heal the epigenetics of black trauma? What if we create this community futures literacy program with a black perspective in mind that can support healing young and adult minds? The California Black Speculative Arts Movement is launching in July. And in partnership with the Museum of Children's Arts, MOCA, and Game Heads, we're about to launch our 2020 Imagining with Afrofuturism initiative, the Black Future School, the Community Future School, that is, where Black futures matter. We're really intentionally thinking about the Community Future School to increase the literacy of futures thinking with everyone, starting with the Black perspective in mind. Because what we're noticing with activists and people right now, that the movement needs an imagination to think further. And it's provocative too. Like defunding the police is great as a provocative point to talk about the redistribution of resources or to increase resources for everything. And how do we use that as a starting point to recreate and reimagine our core institutions? So having a community future school in place with young people, young adults, older people, people in general, where black futures matter, we will help to enable people to see the signals around them of the future and to weave them in storytelling scenarios that they share with each other through our game, through other types of games, to really envision the future of their communities together. What we envision is an equitable futures network of California, a regional network where communities from indigenous people to LGBTQ communities can share and demonstrate and showcase their visions of the future. And so I've decided to do a, a series of short vignettes about the future, headlines of the future. They're called Black AF scenarios in the news. And if you get the term Black AF, you know what I'm talking about. 
So 2020, the nonprofit California Black Speculative Arts Movement launches in July to promote black speculative art and design with its partners, the Museum of Children's Art, Game Heads, and Ancestral Futures. In 2020, the election is in dispute. The military intervenes with Supreme Court approval as Biden assumes the presidency. The U.S. goes into a restorative justice healing and national reconciliation to honor black lives, to apologize for slavery. It becomes a catalyst for reparations as the first stage of the CARES Act, creating a responsible and equitable society. Fast forward to 2022. California BSAM participates in the first California Equitable Futures Network of Imagination Action Conference, where hundreds of black people of color and LGBTQIA organizations showcase their community vision futures for 2032. Again, we're in 2025 now. Community Futures School now has 1,000 alumni with professional certificates in strategic forecasting for the communities and are in demand as foresight coalition builders. Wow, 2300 now. Nova Africa, L5, Space World Nation, Wakanda 5 celebrates its 200th anniversary with Earth and Mars Black Diasporas. In Vibranium Mind LinkedIn to share and leap up in the anti-gravity Ida B. Wells dance, liberatory design at its finest. I end there saying, and want to imagine Afro futures with you, where black futures matter. Thank you. Thank you, Lonnie. That was, um, that was awesome. I think um, if nothing else, um, just getting that perspective is so much different than the futures perspectives than, um, than we've been presenting and uh, and seeing already and you know we had that experience I think as a nation as as Black Panther came out in a broad spectrum but seeing it from the perspective of the futures community which you've now been a part of um, is is fantastic so thank you and um, uh, how was it working with our team to put together all those visuals thank you for helping us with all that uh, that was amazing <laughs> cool. I uh, I really love the the that you captured the artistic uh, artwork that's going on from these, you know, very gifted artists from Stacy Robinson to Menswell Bozeman to Katana Wind. I mean, all these fantastic artists that, and Joshua Mays that have helped us before, um, really are amplifying their work because I mean, it, you know, what's a revolution without art? What's transformation without art? What is a black future without art? It's, it's pretty boring. <laughs> so you, you want, you want to, you want to be able to dance. You want to be able to to enjoy the music and, and enjoy the art that's surrounding you and immersing you. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you brought up this point and I think it's, it's worth touching on again, which is that, you know, we already are present and, and really our future is often, and especially in arts and culture and design is already being defined by the black community. Um, but they generally aren't thinking of themselves as futurists, but as artists or designers. Um, but I think it's a, it's an interesting idea to, you know, as you know, any, anybody who's creating something that lives onto the future, like a product design or a, a piece of music is effectively a, um, a, you know, a, a futurist. So it's, I think that's a great point. And I just, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, Stacy Robinson, for instance, I was just having a great conversation with him this morning about his work in creating black utopias. You know, what about creating more spaces where you enter into and you're carried to a spaces of liberation? So literally, you know, creating exhibitions where you enter into it and you feel a sense of relief. It's like, um, Hyphen Labs did this uh, VR simulation uh, about um, hyperfeminist Afrofeminist futures. And I remember uh, immersing myself in it at the Institute for the Futures Afrofutures Festival that we had. And it was uh, amazing because I felt a sense of relief. Like for a moment, I got a sense of being connected to a broader mind where we, are, we were immersed in feeling ourselves as 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 free, liberated, and at home. And it was just an amazing feeling in that VR simulation. Um, you know, for myself, I also come to it through popular culture. Um, I was born posturally blind. And so I grew up with Star Trek. And the only character that I really saw in Star Trek was Lieutenant Uhura in terms of being black and the other uh, minorities associated with that. But like her, for me, 
and and Jordy in, in Next Jordy Generation Gray. too. Right? <laughs> he he was blind, but we could see in right. in spectacular visions. And so f- for me, that really meant a lot because it meant that um, you know I, I had these Star Trek uh, posters surrounding me on my walls, and I was really fascinated with thinking in a bigger mindset about the future. So that's where I really started on my pathway to foresight. That um, you know, how can we think bigger? How can I not be constrained by my vision and, and and literally envision a different way if I didn't have my physical sense? Very good. Um, I just want to remind all of you that um, that the the channels are open for you to send uh, questions in through the streams that you're watching. Um, but um, right now we're going to bring in uh, Ronaldo Anderson. Um, who is a guest uh, invited by Lonnie um, and um, and and uh, Ronaldo? Um, I believe you um, you worked. You were a co-editor of Afrofuturism 2.0 uh, that invited the essay in by Lonnie. Is that correct? Yes, um, I, and that's how Lonnie and I um, initially became connected. Lonnie and I are both members of the National. Um, NCA National Communication Association. So we, because we both have a background in train, formal training and communication studies. And that was the connection. And I think Lonnie was a perfect fit for some of the things that I was looking at in relation to looking at the future. So it was just a natural fit in terms of what his research interest was at the time. And I was just very lucky. And we were very lucky um, that we were able to um, get him to submit to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, first anthology. Awesome. Do you have a question for for Lonnie for after seeing his talk? Okay, I was uh, Lonnie's probably. I think we've talked about this earlier. I know um, one of the things I've talked about with friends in the last ninety days was how there was going to be a conception of Afrofuturism pre COVID nineteen, and then a, a conception of Afrofuturism post COVID nineteen. And so I would just want to ask him how does he how is he how has the pandemic impacted how, how he's thinking about um, Afrofuturism at the moment, especially the second wave that we've been a part of the last five years? Well, you know, um, I remember hearing a talk at the Long Now actually about um, what would happen if we had autonomous driving. And a, and a speaker there uh, on uh, talking about that uh, said that it would actually free up a lot of political energy that has you know, <laughs> been channeled into parking your cars and finding a parking space and driving in general. And I feel like the, the COVID-19 has actually unleashed political energy and pent up political energy that people have been able to channel, uh, especially black people and protesters, uh, really seeing you know, the time has come to really apologize for enslavement, for inequity with the black community and that more energy can be poured into that, and that we can actually, um, I mean, making use of online space for black liberation spaces is has been also wonderful. Like, like uh, Stacy this this morning, Stacy Robinson was telling me about you know all the DJs that were playing you know at the beginning of the COVID nineteen uh, time and just jamming you know, and it's like wow, you know, we're kind of like jamming ourselves into into revolutionary spins, and I, I like that. Uh, and and to and to see more coalition building um, than I have uh, witnessed in my lifetime, my lifetime has has been fantastic. So I th- I feel like there's there's a hope and a promise, and whether it gets fulfilled or not is really dependent upon a lot of factors. But um, I think that the Black Speculative Arts movement is at the heart of of keeping that forward momentum and other you know other movements that are alongside it too. So um, yeah, <laughs> I can go on and on, but. You know, what do you, how do you feel? Um, one of the things when I'm looking at it going forward, I know um, uh, foreign policy and I guess the Council of Foreign Relations people and a lot of prognosticators are now looking at post-COVID that there's going to probably be a return of a particular, in particular forms of ultra-nationalism. Um, also that the, when it comes to monetary, uh, how money and economics is going to look that the global South is going to really uh, be hurting as it relates to certain type of financial practices in terms of how their currency works. And so that's going to probably lead to certain uh, um, aspects of instability. And, and, uh, and, and, and since we've built 
the international network of the Black Speculative Arts Movement, I was just thinking about how um, it's going to look different in different parts of the world going forward. I remember when we did our event in Johannesburg, the fall of 2018, where a young lady um, named Naledi Cherwa, who's a member of the Economic Freedom Fighters, was talking about how their Afrofuturism was going to be growing from the politics of the stomach. And so, they, and, and they were really practical in terms of, of what it meant for them going forward in relation to the land issue in Southern Africa. And so um, I suspect, uh, as I've mentioned, um, one of the other co-founders, John Jennings, that we're, we're going to have pockets of potential utopia and then pockets of dystopia in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, depending on which geographical region of the world we find ourselves in. But I am seeing a lot of uh, exciting developments that in relation to technology and coalition building and um, as we're going forward and, uh, and we're now you're seeing a lot more dialogue around the concept of acceleration in terms of how this is, uh, it seems like even though we're in July now, it almost feels like January was like a year and a half ago. <laughs> Of so much has happened in the last six months, and so that's kind of where um, people are right now. And I and, and talking with Stacy, this thing seems to be shifting every ninety days in terms of how uh, we're going to have to respond to it. And I think uh, uh, we're going to have to be tremendously flexible uh, moving forward as as the, the um, network and movement keeps moving forward. And in, in, in turn, and I think the the what the the work that uh, you've done with the Long Now Foundation, the forecasting part is going to be uh, incre an incredibly valuable tool to kind of assist other members, and people in the network, uh, whether they're in North America or in Brazil or in uh, West Africa, um, where we had some events last year in Nigeria and Ghana. Yeah, I, I feel like you know um, that's right. On, I mean, in terms of like, we've been talking about how local currencies and investing in cryptocurrencies and digital currencies is really important too, uh, and, and developing those. And like, you know, folks like Ingrid Lafleur and other folks um, that are really learning how to uh, develop uh, local and native currencies that work for our communities. Thank you, Ronaldo, for for that. Um, and I want to um, I want to invite. Ahmed now, um, uh, as uh, Lonnie mentioned, he worked uh, with uh, Ahmed uh, on the most recent podcast, but many of you know him as the voice from Jar Jar Binks and uh, is a futurist in his own right. So welcome, Ahmed. Hello. Hello. How are Hello. you? Good to see you. Hey. It looks like you got a very professional audio set up there. It's nice. You're a voice actor, so you must have this all the time. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> life of the professional podcaster. Now, um, I started out my career as a musician. Um, and so I've had multitudes of instruments just follow me through my lifetime. And now they're all in one place, which I'm, which I'm very happy about. Um, and the other thing about being Jar Jar Binks is um, I'm often uh, for just being the voice, but that's very, a very small part of what I did. Um, I, I was actually the first motion capture hybrid actor in film history. And when we're talking about black bodies contributing to the future, and we're talking about black artists and art contributing to the future, a lot of times our contributions are not really talked about with the weight and with the extent that they need to be talked about. And we don't envision our black artists as futurists when it comes to our performance. We mentioned Sun Ra, um, who really started um, the idea of this cosmic journey sonically, which Parliament Funkadelic picked up, which Africa Bambata and the Soul Sonic Force picked up in the 80s, which spawned, you know, Cool Herc and all of those cats in the Bronx, where I'm from, New York City, to invent hip hop. And now you can't find a song anywhere that doesn't use any type of technology. And that was Black futurists. That was Black artists. And we create um, the code that societies then adopt to move the systems forward. 
And um, because I was a co-creator of the code that created this entire new form of filmmaking, every film that you see that has any type of uh, CGI in it has me in it. So Black people and African people in the in natural sense of Afrofuturism and Afrofuturist thinking have contributed to industries um, and, and the inner workings and the architecture and the coding of industries uh, since the beginning of time. Thank you. Um, and after seeing, I know you work with Lonnie quite a bit, but um, after seeing this talk, I was wondering if you had a, a question along the lines of, uh, of the talk as well. Yeah, um, we haven't really talked about, and, and Ronaldo and, and Lonnie started leaning into this a little bit, but we haven't talked about this idea of um, poverty and um, how systems are created to perpetuate poverty and how Afrofuturists and in Afrofutures, the idea of wealth and the, and the idea of poverty that have been Eurocentric primarily have been shifted when we're talking about Afrofutures. And I would love for Lonnie to elaborate on the idea of poverty being a system that needn't exist and how Afrofuturism really lends to that idea. Yeah, uh, in fact, you know, I've been talking to a lot of folks, um, including you, about developing scenarios around what does reparations look like in terms of, you know, if we can, if we can help um, lift, uh, help expand health, wealth, and education for black people, we can help it for everyone. And that what do, what do reparations look like as a form that uh, enables black people to, you know, have their bodies respected and their minds expanded uh, from where they are now. I mean, you know, we've done pretty relatively well considering all the obstacles in our face, but just think about the unleashed economic prosperity of having a guaranteed income that supports us, that lets us not just be in jobs that we don't want to be in, but that support our minds, right? I mean, if you want to talk about real prosperity, you'd unleash that. So it, it comes down to political will, you know? And so I think that Afrofutures has a lot to, to talk about that and speak to. And uh, so I'm excited about trying to develop those scenarios of reparations. What does that look like? And that includes some type of national reconciliation and actual apology from the American government to black people, um, you know, as a cornerstone of that. Absolutely. Uh, I think what's really exciting about what's going on right now, especially with the with the recent uprising, is that young people um, understand that systems and working within systems don't have to be the only answer. If you think about it, the generations now, they grew up with systems changing every 18 months and less, right? Six to 18 months following Moore's Law, right? So they have no problem letting an operating system go and completely starting a brand new operating system. Now that's them in their computing world and then their computing world turned mobile. And now their mobile world is turning internal and generational. So when we talk about systems set up um, for, and Lonnie and I, we talk about this all the time, but when we talk about systems set up to maintain a status quo that does not really work at the pace in which um, the people right now, the young people right now are operating, then um, it's time for the entire system to change. And so rather than thinking about things like how do we deal with waste, we imagine worlds where waste isn't uh, in existence. How do we deal with poverty? We imagine a world where poverty doesn't exist. And then we work backwards and we figure out the steps to get there. But the young people right now are in such, um, they're teaching us so much about how we do not have to settle for systemic problems, right? We can change the system. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm inspired by uh, the Institute for the Future's work on governance design too, that informs our own work and bridges it to Afrofuturist thinking as well. Um, you know, how do we see our institutions as eroded and remake them and transform them and radically change them to meet our needs, you know? Um, 
I'm inspired by movements like restorative justice thinking, right? That helps people. What would a city look like if it was based on restorative justice thinking? You know, you'd have radically different ways of policing that would protect communities. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And we've we talked about a lot about, you know, what ideas of policing are, reimagining policing. And, you know, this idea of defunding the police is um, just a, a very welcome start. And the addition to defunding the police is refunding the people, right? Because when you take that money away from militarization of the police force and you put it back into the communities, when you're talking about education, when you're talking about you know, eradicating food deserts, when we're talking about abundance and jobs, all of a sudden a community thrives and the idea of a militarized police becomes ludicrous. So it's the Afrofuturist thinking reimagines all of these things based on our experience. Yeah, I think that, you know, the working backwards um, thing, I, I remember uh, seeing an interview with the woman who is the um, the futurist who designed Wakanda, and I loved her description where she says the, the center of the city is the archive and the library, and the entire thing spirals out from there, and it's, it's this kind of like, and so she used this staple into th their future and as to why their city was so, the past was so important to the city um, to basically design the entire rest of the city. It was a super powerful concept. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think about the Underground Railroad, right, the Underground Railroad, Railroad encompasses all of the, the, what Lonnie was talking about when he was talking about the parts of the brain that can perceive the past can also speculate about the future. Right. The Underground Railroad is that in an actual tangible way of thinking. Astronomically, these stars, which exploded billions and billions of, of light years away in the past, are just now is reaching the, the Earth. And enslaved Africans are using the past light to look towards a better future. Hmm. That's entire scope of what Afrofuturism is and the ability to perceive both the past and the future in the exact same moment. Nice. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Ahmed. And can you mention the name of your podcast again that you guys do together? The podcast is called The Afrofuturist Podcast. Um, Lonnie Brooks and I created it together. And um, you can find it on iTunes and Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. We talk to speculative fiction artists, technologists. Um, uh, we talk to uh, uh, politicians recently, which has been in incredibly interesting, designers, but everyone who uses Afrofuturist thinking to move whatever they're doing forward. Cool. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. And uh, we're going to get to some questions from uh, from our audience. Um, I think there's... Um, the one of the questions we have from uh, Renata Barreto off of Facebook is um, is actually about the Athro Rhythms game and is is it available now and um, and where do you get it? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're actually working on the second uh, stage of that design of the game, um, and right now we have an original uh, card deck, and uh, that that you know we are willing to uh, you know talk with you about and work with, um, we're looking forward to our next stage uh, iteration of this card game um, that will be available through probably a Kickstarter. Um, but we're also talking to, since we're getting so many inquiries about it right now, we're really excited about it. Um, we are going to be, um, you know, just email me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, we'll also talk about it in Long Now as it comes out too. So yeah. uh, feel, feel free to stay tuned with Long Now about it as well. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, and uh, Rafael Sequeros, Sequeros, I believe, or Sequeros, uh, from uh, over email asked, um, how involved scholars are from sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the African diaspora outside the US in the uh, Afrofuturism movement? Yeah, so um, we have, uh, well, there was a, a special issue uh, done by the Journal of Future Studies on African Futures. And so uh, we are in dialogue with them. And also uh, the Black Speculative Arts Movement was just did a series of BSAMs in Ghana and in um, uh, Cape Town. And so uh, it was a, like wonderful moments of connection uh, and stuff that was going on also in Nigeria too. So, uh, so BSAMs are sprouting up and it's kind of this embrace of what 
we're calling Afrofuturism 3.0 when when Africa kind of uh, African nations embrace it too and style it on their on their own. Um, you know, Jeremy Kirschbaum of the Institute for the Future is also working with and highlighting African innovators, uh, in especially Nigeria and Kenya and other places. Um, so that's really exciting. But um, the Black Speculative Arts movement is really catching on uh, in terms of investing in Afrofuturist thinking with uh, scholars and uh, activists there. So it's, it's cool. going forward. Um, and actually, I mean, along those lines, uh, someone who identifies as Africa America on Facebook uh, stream um, mentions that, um, you know, the Ghana is uh, often referred to as a modern day Wakanda. Um, and um, do you have any pros or cons and how we use it, utilize the positive movement there? Well, I mean, I think the the, the energy there is uh, I want to I want to go to Ghana. I haven't been there yet, you know, and from what I'm hearing about, it's just the idea of how how folks from America are, uh, arrive in Ghana feeling more liberated uh, than you know being here in the states, um, and how Ghana has celebrated um, the anniversary of slavery by inviting um, African Americans to come live there. Um, so I feel like there's there's lots of uh, potential and promise in what Ghana is doing and in, in its in its forward thinking and foresight. So I, I'm excited about you know there's. You know, how do we create Wakanda, you know, uh, and our own vision of it, you know, that is actually more inclusive than maybe the Wakanda we saw in the film, too, with uh, with Afroqueer futures as well. And I, I think I want to go back a little bit to some of the games that you're working on. I mean, um, the um, Stuart Candy is a research fellow here at Long Now who created that that card game, uh, that thing from the future, which you then uh, worked with him. It sounded like to adapt this, uh, the card game for that, and then um, and then Dynamic Land over in the East Bay. Can you? Dynamic Land is kind of this amazing thing that I think not enough people know about. Um, and I was just wondering um, if you could just say a little bit more about how that lab works and and how your work there uh, dovetailed in. Yeah, that was an amazing experience um, where you, they have this loft on 9th Street um, and they have rafters of computer projectors um, that project um, programs onto and make uh, you know, three by five pieces of paper into playable media. Uh, and, and the media, are, the paper have colored dots around them to read a barcode that then makes the paper uh, playable. And when we saw that and were immersed in it, the idea was to create collaboration across with people in computing rather than people being on their own individual screens and on their laptops and phones, but actually have a collaborative-based computing platform where people can, commute, you know, can, can do creative things together and look at each other. You know? And I just love that. And so when I met uh, Eli Kosminski, uh, we actually did an Afrofuturist podcast with uh, some of the interaction designers like uh, Paula, uh, too, who was there, uh, and others. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, so when I met Eli, you know, he was really open to thinking about, well, how do we, how do we invent Wakanda here? And, uh, and he helped me with his uh, you know, access expertise into, in computing to make this dream come alive. So when it turned into Afrorhythms for the Future, it was, uh, we actually created the game in the dynamic land medium, where you could kind of see dynamically how, uh, how people's ideas were connected. And that was really exciting. Um, you know, they literally, the paper would light up uh, and, and play different scenes from the future in front of you. Um, so yeah, great cool. space. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's such a cool space and I, more people should, should utilize it in the way you do. It's such a collaborative space. Um, and let's see. Um, I wanted to get to another question here. Um, and you know, you, you're now been in academia for a bit, um, working with Cal State East Bay for for quite a while. And um, and Ario Jones or Ario Rio Jones uh, from YouTube asked a question: um, Are there any other recommendations for academia to take part in Afrofuturism? Are there are there good areas that this is happening? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely like uh, UC Riverside with John Jennings uh, in the um, undergraduate and graduate programs where he teaches Afrofuturist co courses, um, also at UCLA. Um, and, you know, it's happening um, in, 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 in universities across the land, especially in our university. We have like three other professors that are running Afrofuturism courses right now. I, I ran one of the first ones uh, uh, last year. And uh, that's been a joy to kind of join in 
and have work with other black faculty in creating Afrofuturist courses. Uh, and they, they do it different ways, you know. So from, from, the, from the English perspective, from ethnic studies, from, um, you know, from, from communication, my field. So we look at the future of media in that case, in that context. Um, so I think uh, there's actually, I know a middle school teacher who's creating a Conjuring Worlds uh, textbook for middle school uh, on Afrofuturism. Also, Katita Johnson at the Oakland Technical High School is creating and building Afrofuturism curriculum for the Fashion Academy there. Really great uh, working with her and also at the Museum of Children's Arts as well. So it's happening in academia and in um, you know, high school, middle school, and other institutions uh, like that. Cool. Um, and I want to also get back to that, um, the paper you wrote for Afrofuturism 2.0, where, you know, Long Now and many of the futurists that founded Long Now and the IFTF, uh, the Institute for the Future, really, um, you, you talked about how, um, how you weren't represented in these organizations, um, but were at the same time were invited in in certain contexts. But um, can you elaborate on that? And, and uh, it was, I thought it was, it was really refreshing and great to see um, that context for us. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think um, IFTF from when I first uh, landed there in 1998 as this, you know, uh, wide-eyed graduate student to now has made tremendous strides. You know, last year they, they helped support our Afro Futures Festival uh, with, with the Black Speculative Arts Movement and the Museum of the African Diaspora, uh, too, and others. And um, kind of seeing their own evolution in terms of futures thinking has been refreshing itself, too. Um, they've done work in the Sudan. Um, they've uh, created a good for uh, a good for future fellows program where they have people from the community that are doing really interesting, innovative things and work in community futures too. So, um, but I have to say, you know, when I first got there, I I felt uh, I felt I couldn't see myself in the in the future that they were generating. And uh, but they actually immersed me in some of the skits that we did, uh, you know, for the future and. And, and we actually did get to do one amazing festival in San Diego in 2001 with the Encanto community, where we, where we did have digital storytelling done by community activists uh, for the black community there. And that was kind of the first glimpse that I could see of that actually happening. Now, I wish it had not taken as long to get there as we are now, but just seeing that kind of embryo happening was amazing. Um, you know, and I, ha I know it happens in isolated instances and now it's more coalesced. Uh, and, 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 and thankfully, you know, IFTF has trained me well to be able to articulate this and to generate future scenarios like I can wake up and just do it in my, in my sleep. So <laughs> nice. no, and you, um, w when we worked with you several years ago, um, on the, um, futures classes, um, at, uh, at Cal State yeah. East Bay, you did, um, I believe you did a class that was a hundred years and a thousand years te teaching effectively teachers how to think about futures that are, that are very far in advance. And can you say a little bit about that? Yes. I have to have my hats off to Andrea Severi, our consultant on that, who helped me develop, um, uh, projects for futures thinking, especially the one that we do is like, uh, you know, what does your future look like in 2054 as a one and a half page story? And you have to develop signals and uh, create a scenario storytelling about your future organizational life. Uh, and then we also did a fun, a fun exercise where it's like, what are 10 things that you would want in the next 10,000 years? You know, and we would joke and say, well, like the Beatles are forever, you know, or you gotta have, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta have, um, Al Green or, you know, Sam Cooke with you too. <laughs> nice. um, but, you know, so uh, those types of things were, because of course with undergraduates, it's not easy to think about, you know, more than a year ahead. Um, but with them, they, what I would get in terms of feedback from them would be like, wow, you know, I, I turned up at my interview with my prospective employer and, and told them about what I was doing in terms of envisioning the future and they were really impressed. Um, so we have several alumni now like um, Melissa Marin, CEO at Twitter, and others at uh, Facebook and Google that have really been able to leverage their insight about the future and hopefully make it more inclusive, right? Uh, that's totally. the real goal. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, we're gonna close. Um, we're, we're coming up on past, past the hour here, but um, I, I think Peter Layden, uh, who's watching on YouTube, um, 
has a great question for us to close on. Um, and he asks if, if you could talk a bit more about why people can be allies in the Afrofutures movement, and yes. more, even more specifically, how people in the Long Now community can get connected and involved. I know you have some openings coming up very soon. So, Yeah, I want to mention a uh, uh, big shout out to my, one of my biggest allies, Jason Tester, and his Queer the Future initiative. Um, you know, he's been wonderful in actually uh, mentoring me you know, as, because we came in together at the Institute for the Future, and he's been just this visionary in thinking about what do queer futures look like 10 to 20 to, you know, 100,000 years from now. And I, he inspires me every day, and I think that's so important. Um, Eli Kosminski and others, I think it's, there's a, a real tremendous advantage and coalition uh, being able to be built with um, white allies coming in, um, and I, you know, Ahmed and I talk about this, like what is another term for allies than, than that one? Because you know, uh, we want to make it even a kind of a deeper in, uh, intimate connection. But uh, having them you know, understand where we're coming from and listening is really important. And knowing that black futures can help steer this. You know, it's, not, it's not them directing us, it's us telling them, here's what we envision, help us get there, you know? So Absolutely. that's, you know, really important. Cool. And um, as far as the Long Now community, I mean, we have um, thousands of people, mostly um, concentrated here on the West Coast, but we're really worldwide. And I'm, you know, thinking about your responsibility, hopefully over the next 10,000 years. Um, and I just, what, what, can, uh, what can you say to this community or, or some next steps um, that you think would be interesting for them and you? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, making sure that the library for the next 10,000 years has uh, more uh, black futures thinking embedded in it. You know, like what you said about the Wakanda having the library at its center. And I think making sure that, that we have those inclusive visions embedded in the DNA of 10,000 years. Because I think in my mind, it's not so much a, thing, a singularity, but a multiplicity of visions that create next stage AI with more profound empathic African soul, you know, at the, at, the, at, the, at the beginning of our species. So I would say looking at that, uh, you know, having more African time as part of our rhythms. Nice. Uh, well, that's a <laughs> perfect place for us to end. Thank you so much, Lonnie. Really great seeing you again and having you here with your family tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sander. And thanks to our guests, uh, Ahmed and Ronaldo. And thank all of you who watched uh, online. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you very much.